Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Black Welcome to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal, and we are joined today in the John Hope Franklin Center with curator extraordinaire Chantrell P. Lewis. How are you doing? I'm great. Hi, Mark. What are you doing in dorm these days? You know, just kicking it with my bestie, <laughs> Dr. Yaba Blay, <laughs> trying to see some good work, some art. Mm. So you have this new project that you've been um, taking around the country. It's been in San Francisco, the Dandelion Project. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for our audiences who don't know what a dandy is, mm -hmm. talk about what a dandy is, and in particular, talk about a dandy in relationship to black masculinity. Okay, right. so it's actually um, an ongoing project that I've been, I first curated in 2010, so it has some legs now and it's grown, but I feel like every time it travels to a new space or a new museum, it becomes another thing. It takes on something yeah, else. Yeah, something else. So um, its most recent iteration was at the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. It's going to the Brighton Photo Biennial, which is the largest photography festival in the UK. Um, then I'll be traveling, I think, down to Houston and then to the Low um, Art Museum in Miami. So, and then it'll be a book next year. So it's lots of wings and, and iterations. Talk about the excitement around that, you know, because, you know, my daughter's an art, studying art history, mm -hmm. right? And everybody wants to be able to curate their own show. And, and there's a way now in which the term curate circulates in the world that everybody's curating Oh, I hate something. it. I hate like, it. I'm curating a panel. I'm, right? I'm curating my closet. <laughs> I'm, like, you know, curating yeah. my shoe collection. <laughs> or I'm curating my pencils on my desk. No. So that's the buzzword, right? But, right. but if you are someone to train to be a curator, right. right? I mean, you are looking for that moment where you get to finally curate your show. Right. Um, how does it feel to be able to do that show with your own vision and then talk about all the places that it gets to go? I mean, th it, having it being featured in, at this uh, biannual mm -hmm. in um, Britain, I mean, that's a big deal. Yeah, it is. It's kind <laughs> of like a big deal. <laughs> that's, that's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> it is. So I think, so I, I mean, I didn't get into curating like with intention. It wasn't, it wasn't intentional. I was actually in grad school at Temple and yeah, because you know the, the dirty little secret I found out is like you were like a chemistry yeah, minor and biology, and biology major, major, major at Howard. At Howard. Yeah. How the hell did that happen? Well, so really, it's about my <laughs> love for Africana studies, for Black people, for the diaspora. And so um, at Howard, I had an opportunity to double major in Africana studies. And after that, I went to Temple to pursue, you know, my master's degree in African American studies. And while there, got drawn into the African American Museum in Philadelphia, which I remember the very first time that I walked into the institution. I've been to like black museums in New Orleans, where I'm from, um, before, but it was like this three, four stories of like art, history, and culture all about us. Mm -hmm. And the walls were a reflection of who we are as a people. And I remember there was an exhibition that Dr. Deb Willis curated called Saturday Night, Sunday Morning about what we do as a community on Saturday nights and Sunday mornings. And there was an image of a woman dancing on top of a casket. And before I read the actual, you know, like the wall text to say who photographed the image and where was it taken, I was like, that's home, that's New Orleans. You're not going to see nobody else dancing on top of a right. casket, right. but New Orleans. And it was a photograph that was taken by Eric Waters. And it, it just blew me away. One, that I was able to connect with the image as a person from New Orleans. Also, the power of photography as a medium um, and telling it was like so textured and so layered. And I, I was like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And so I curated my first exhibition. Jamel Shabazz was in that show. Um, Ayana Jackson, right. uh, Layla. Jamel Shabazz, who's a great photographer who we yes. know from back in the day. Some of the early brilliant right. hip hop, you know, stuff Absolutely. he captured in the Bronx and the right. Brooklyn of, of what was hip hop in that right. early moment. Right. The, the real get down. Right? Exactly. And he was in my first <laughs> exhibition, and it was like packed, and it was in it was done in honor of another photographer, and so. Um, I was like, I, it was like a, a sort of like fire that grew inside of me, like in terms of the power of like art, you know, namely, but like using art as a platform to really educate people about our history and our culture, which is really my true passion. Like I'm just 
whatever is black, black here, black in Brazil, <laughs> black in Lagos, <laughs> black in, you know, uh, the Belmer in Amsterdam, that's my passion, really. And it's like art is just a tool that I use and curating is a tool that I use. And so, you know, I've worked for different institutions. I went down to New Orleans after Katrina back home and became the uh, director of the, the McKinnon Museum and revitalized that. I went to New York, worked at the Caribbean Cultural mm -hmm. Center with Dr. Vega, mm -hmm. which is tremendous. And after that, I, was just, I went to become an independent curator. Right. And it was through, yeah, yeah, you know, because it, I, it, working in institutions, particularly if they're like large, predominantly white institutions, and you're a black curator, I mean, you only get an opportunity to do a show like that show you know, every blue moon. It's not something like you're able to like bang out, you know, every time you get a brand new idea. Yeah. And there's so much like bureaucracy that's involved with that in politics. You know, you have to please like so many different people. And as an independent curator, I can do shows about whatever I want to do shows about. So, I mean, I've curated exhibitions, you know, ranging from subject matter from, you know, Dandelion, which was an independent show right. that grew. Um, shows about Haiti, New Orleans, the South. Uh, I did a show about, um, uh, the new American contemporary Black South, um, sex crimes against Black girls. I mean, there's so many different things, and that's the power of being an independent curator. And so, you know, just having an idea um, that you're interested in, you know, being able to engage with artists who are also doing incredible and powerful work, and then cr constructing this platform in which to get all kinds of people engaged around discourse is a very powerful thing. And it's not as threatening as, like, other forms of activism, like people mm -hmm. tend to distance themselves from like, oh, you know, they tend to put people in certain boxes like, oh, you're on your soapbox, I'm not going to no rallies, I'm, I'm not down with all that extra black stuff or, you know, my dad is always calling me Afrocentric, you know, you so Afrocentric, Chantrell, <laughs> you know, I'm like, is that a problem, dude, you know what I mean? So, um, I think that's what curating has allowed me to do instead of, you know, just the academic route. Yeah. Or like the education about like being in a classroom and teaching like on a post, you know, like a secondary level. It's allowing me to engage with multiple different types of audiences, like academics, um, young kids that will come into a museum right. and see right. like this, right. you know, a 30 foot tall black man on a wall and like, why, like just get blown away by that, you know, and that's like so powerful. What drew you to black dandies? And, and for the audience, I'm, I'm wearing my dandy you, I socks. I see your socks, I'm, you know, uh, I peep game. In honor of <laughs> I peeped game as soon as we came in. Um, you know, honestly, during that time, I had a, a friend in Gozi Odita, who's the founder of Social Media Week Lagos, and mm -hmm. who co-owned Harry's Alter Eagle, which was a shop in Brooklyn that just kind of set trends and styles for like Hats a whole- and bow ties. And just, every, well, just everything like African-centered type of clothing, I guess. Yeah. And um, she asked me to curate an exhibition at a pop-up gallery, and I was like thinking about things, like do I do an exhibition about HBCUs? <laughs> Um, like, what do I do an exhibition on? And like, just thinking about my own personal passions, and I was like, why not black men? And it was, it was 2010, I was thinking about the ways in which black men are being portrayed and have mm -hmm. been portrayed in, in media and mm -hmm. popular culture from birth of a nation on down. Um, and like the menacing black man, the black man that's thug, the way that hip hop has been commercialized, commercialized mm -hmm. so that the same repetitive image of black masculinity is right. repeated yeah. constantly. And so, um, it, I, I, being from the South, being from New Orleans, where you got dressed, like your pants were starched, like ironing, you know, <laughs> ironing is a pastime, right? right? Sending your clothes to the cleaners, um, thinking about my, my dad who wore suspenders, um, images I've seen like my great grandparents, my younger brother who was like 12 and had this like huge collection of Kenneth Coles yeah. in his closet. <laughs> um, and I remember going even to Howard and thinking like, yo, where are these people going? Like, are you going to class? Like right. dressed like this? church, right, right. <laughs> because where we come from, we got dressed up, right, in the South. And so just thinking about like w how the, the respect that a well-dressed ma uh, man like commands, right? And it's, it's such a precarious thing because there's like respectability in that. Yeah. And yeah. you know, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of the boys, like big fan. Um, one of my mentors, Dr. Anthony Montero at, at Temple just had me fall in love with the boys. And so I know at one time, like the early 20th century, and Monica Miller, um, mm -hmm. Barnard, um, Columbia College, um, author of Slays to Fashion, right. she, right. you know, perfectly articulated the trajectory of the black dandy, um, but, I, so it functioned differently, I think, in the 20th century, 
um, for our ancestors in the way that it does differently now. So I think a lot of it had to be about respectability before, like in dressing up for right. white people, essentially. Right. And now I think black dandies are dressing up for themselves, whether men or women. Um, a black dandy is a, someone who Africanizes European menswear, um, particularly Edwardian era type of yeah. menswear. And so I don't call like so zoot like, suits. Fre like Frederick Douglass is like the original dandy. Right? Frederick Douglass, <laughs> Frederick the super dandy, right? <laughs> Paul Robeson, yeah. you know, definitely dandy. I mean, the boys Jack himself. Jack Johnson, right. Oh, yeah, all these folks, are, yeah, yeah, definitely. And so um, what people are doing today in the air communities like the Congo and Brazzaville, where that Sapira culture is, is, is huge, or the Swankas in South Africa, is that they're like they're taking like European wear and then like Africanizing, putting like you know different color colors on it, like Oswald Boateng. I mean, right. he's taking right. you know this suit, this traditional men's suit, and use these like infuses very vibrant colors and and African like accoutrements and, and sensibilities into like menswear, and so that's what people are doing all around the world. And so if you go to urban areas, you see the same things like yeah, people right. popping up in terms of how they're expressing themselves. And what I think is so unique and was why it's so powerful in an age where the black masculine image is so constructed. Um, this, I think this is a, an act of rebellion. It's like a form of oppositional fashion. And it's, I mean, we see that with the NBA, right? You know, right. 20 years ago, the commissioner says, you guys have to wear suits, right. you know, when you go on the road. Which is respectability. And 15 years later, they're like, okay, we got to wear suits, we're going to wear we're suits. We're going to wear them. <laughs> right. And it reminds me, actually, of uh, a law during the Black Codes in Louisiana, the, mm -hmm. um, the Tignon Law where black women were told that they had to wrap their hair up because it was a way to like distinguish them between white women. Because right, right. you know, a lot of well-to-do black women in Louisiana, so they were like, oh, that's what we gotta do, so we about to flip that and rock right, that, right? right, right and right, make it a fashion right. statement to the point where then now white women were also trying to- To wrap their hair up. Exactly, <laughs> like to try to steal our, you know, our shine. But, um, you know, I think it's like when you dress up, you know, like how, what's the reaction that people yeah. give you? Yeah, you know that, and it's a thing of self-pride, and so it has less to do with, I think, black people assimil assimilating white culture as it more to do with, like, how we present, like, as a people. Like, traditionally in, on a continent, throughout our communities in the diaspora, like, you know, if you go to like Detroit or Chicago and it's like these brothers going into like a, you know, a juke joint or a cabaret and they have on their like mm -hmm. lime green, snakeskin shoes and their suits <laughs> and they're clean, right? I even ran to a brother yesterday and he complimented me on my perfume. I was like, oh, and I smelled his cologne. But I was like, do I tell him that I can smell his cologne or not? I was like, let me tell this, bro. I was like, oh yeah, what's that thing? Because he, he wants you to smell his cologne. Absolutely, right. so I was like, what's that thing you're wearing? He was like, oh, that's just my natural, you know, body odor. He was like, nah, it's just something, whatever, Givenchy that. He was like, I put on this morning. Thank you, you know, for noticing, though. I was like, let me get this brother, like. Which, which, which reminds me, shout out to the homie Joan Morgan. I need to do my re-up of Emily Jane. Yes. Anyway. Oh, I have on Emily Jane right now, too. She just gave me some for my ultra birthday. Smells so good. But, yeah, no, I think, it's, it, you know, it's very powerful, too. Like, yeah. dress is so powerful. I mean, because it's the first thing that people, right. you know, interact with. And, of course, um, there are those who contend that, you know, you shouldn't be judged by, you know, physical right. appearances and dress. And, like, black men should, if they want to wear oversized T-shirts and khaki pants and it's fine or whatever. But there are, like, real-life implications that are connected to that. And not that I think that we need to change our dress to become humanized. Because I think that, you know white people need to deal with their issues when they're like engaging with us. Um, but there, there is something to be said about like how uh, this certain particular image has been co-opted and mass produced so that it, to dress like in a particular type of way that's like hyper masculine and like thug or whatever you want to call it, um, is actually not rebellious in and of itself because it's a part of like this corporate machine, a prison industrial complex. And so for me, dressing like as a dandy, like in a hood, is actually an act of rebellion. Whether you're queer, whether you're straight, whether you're a man, you're a woman, like when like just really getting dressed up in like urban environments um, is really rebellious in and of itself. You're watching Left of Black. We're joined here today by curator Chantrell P. Lewis. One of the projects that you've been working on in the past, Black Pete. Um, and a lot of folks don't know much about Black Pete and this kind of larger history of Santa Claus. Talk about this Black Pete film project that, that you've been working on. 
Yeah, so one of the things, again, as being an independent curator, I've been able to like explore like subject matter within a diaspora that really interests me. And I had an opportunity to go to the Netherlands to do a curatorial residency to study black Dutch art. And I didn't even know there were black people in the Netherlands. I was like, wait, there, I was like, when a woman asked me, I was like, you know I study black folks, right? She was like, yeah, I was like, well, so where they have black folks at in the Netherlands? She was like, uh, everywhere, I was like, where they come from? She was like, Suriname, Curacao, Aruba. So I went to the Netherlands and I, the first trip, because I've been going back and forth now for yeah. the past five years, um, and was enamored with like how diverse and vast black culture is in the Netherlands. Um, I was primarily living in the, in the Belmer, which is Southeast Amsterdam, and where the majority of the like black community live in, at least in Amsterdam, there are mm -hmm. lots of, a, a huge concentration of black folks also in Rotterdam, probably a higher concentration than Amsterdam. And so, you know, I'm like engaging with people from Suriname, from Curaçao, from Aruba, the Dutch Antilles, um, a lot of East Africans, West Africans. And I'm, I'm just like enamored by this culture because like in Africana studies, we don't really learn and study and teach that much about black the Dutch. In Europe, right? Yeah, it's like black people in Europe, yeah. one, um, but then also like the Dutch Caribbean, like we learn right. about this, you know, the Spanish speaking Caribbean, right. Portuguese, French, but right. like the Dutch is like this big question mark. And so um, I was like opening books and like in doing artist studio visits. And I'm like, that's a kind, like, and I'm making references between a kind spirituality and, and maroon culture in mm -hmm. like the heart of Suriname. And so I'm just like extremely fascinated by this. But while I'm studying this and all in love, like, oh my God, I want to move to the Netherlands. I started seeing these like little figurines all over the place, like in the the store called the Hema, which is kind of like the equivalent of Target. There's like this like menstrual figure, and I was like, what? I was like, because um, <laughs> you know I, I'm 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 American, right? I acknowledge my American lens. I'm from the U.S., and so I'm like, is that a is that a menstrual? I was like, what's that? Right? Because you know we tend to as as Americans we go overseas and then we put our lens on everything all the time. And we have this, even as black people, African-Americans or black Americans, there's like this, this hegemony in terms of like yeah. black thought, right? And US centric black thought. So I'm trying to check myself before I start, you know, assuming things. And they were like, oh, that's Swart the Pete. I'm like, what the who? And they're like, Swart the Pete. I was like, what, what's that? And I'm like, oh, Swart the Pete is Santa Claus's helper. Um, <laughs> who is, yeah, comes out and gives candy and cookies to the boys and girls. And so I was like, what the hell is this? So I'm starting to do research about You're it. like, wait, wait, this Santa's slave? This, exactly. <laughs> so I'm doing research about it, and it's exactly what it is. So it's like, if you take, so basically, the how we practice the, the, um, the more commercial side of Christmas, um, is through the same origins as the way the Dutch do. Like right. when the Dutch came over, they brought like the Christmas right. um, practice of it, um, the culture, right? But the way the story, like the Christmas stories were popularized in the US and in the Netherlands were different. So there was a story here that, a children's story where like Santa Claus had elves and helpers right. and lived and, in the North Pole. Black, the elves were black people. Yeah, yeah, not here, but there, <laughs> right, yeah, in the right, Netherlands. So it was like it's, black people. Right, right. And so it, that also coincided with the emancipation of enslaved Africans in the Dutch, Caribbean. So now you have like enslaved Africans being replaced with Santa, I mean, Santa Claus's helper, Swarthy Pete, which is like a buffoon. It's like stupid. Um, so where white people are in blackface, like straight up okay. Amos and Andy blackface. You know, and, and they were like, but this isn't racist. Like, you're bringing your American race. I'm like, first of all, I can't be racist, I'm black. But beyond that, I'm not bringing racism anywhere. This is what y'all are doing. And I'm like, how do black people feel about this? And it was very, um, very challenging and nuanced because we, as again, black Americans, we think about our long history of like civil rights since we first were brought on these shores like 400 years ago. In the Netherlands, it's different. Slavery was all the way in South America in the Caribbean, right. not in the Netherlands, so in they Europe. Didn't have that connection right. So when black people were just coming over, they started coming over in droves in like the mid 20th century. So it wasn't really actually until like the 70s and 80s that there were like large populations of black people coming to the Netherlands. So that's not their homeland in the ways that we have ownership over the states because right. we built this country. Right. So, you know, they knew about Swarte P, but what are they going to say when they're trying to actually like live, 
you know, work. Because, I mean, people would get fired from jobs for speaking out against what they paid. So when I came, when I first went there, it was just wild. So I met a group of um, two brothers, who um, young brothers who started a grassroots movement called Swart the Peters Racisma, um, Swart the Peters Racism in Dutch. And they just started with a shirt that said that. And they went to a parade wearing that shirt during the, the Christmas holiday season right. and got arrested. But it was like a brutal arrest, you know, like they were being right. dragged and through the streets and pepper sprayed just for wearing a shirt that said Swart the Peters Racism. And you have to think about it, it's like, if you were to take Christmas and Mardi Gras and mix it together, that's how big it is. So even in the schools, right. children have Swart the Peters coming in the schools, they're dressing up as Swart the Peters. Right. You know, it's like Swart the Peters coloring books and plays and, you know, the national Dutch television, they do a big, huge production every year. So it's crazy, but like over the past five years, um, black people and even non-black allies have been, you know, banding together pushing and back. really right. pushing back in a way that was not even happening five years ago. So the last time that I was in the Netherlands, um, earlier this year, um, there was like a big celebration, um, Keti Koti, which is uh, translated as the breaking of chains um, in Srinantongo, which is Surinamese language spoken by most Surinamese people. Um, you know, there was a lot of like huge like activities around Swarthy Peters Racisma. And every year, like the protests get bigger and bigger and bigger like where number one they've contacted the United Nations and you know basically stated that this is like really um, a violation of our human rights and so the working group of experts of people of African descent actually got involved and denounced the tradition they started getting th death threats they did a report um, I don't know if you knew but last year the the UN named um, this the decade as the next 10 years as a decade of um, international decade for people of African descent and so during that time period um, there's lots of things going on There's a conference happening um, this week in DC but as many things happening in different countries that are really focused on like the human rights of people of African descent like reparations it's a big CARICOM push for reparations in the Caribbean um, but to ban Swarthy Pete is also a part of that agenda okay. that a lot of activists are working towards so in me studying the black Dutch art um, and, and, and art from the Dutch Caribbean, I'm also looking at race and xenophobia in right. the Netherlands and, and black identity. Remind our audience again about where Dandelion goes over the next year. Dandelion will be traveling to the Brighton Photo Biennial in the UK um, in October 2016. Um, then it will be traveling to down to Houston, October through December. Then it will be traveling to uh, the Low Museum of Art in Miami, February through May of next year, and then the book Aperture, which is huge photography book publisher, is publishing Dandelion, so it'll be out in a bookstore, in Urban Outfitters, a library <laughs> near you. Congratulations. Thank you, Mark. A lot of thank You've been watching Left of Black. I'm Mark Anthony. I want to thank uh, curator Chantrell P. Lewis for joining us here today and talking about her work. Uh, see you next week. Black lights and boots burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back